Glock has tattoos on his head, and he was born into society. When the wizard no longer holds the small stick, when muggles distort the technology tree. The muzzle is shining with magic. The burst of magic replaced the smoke of gunpowder, the thunderous shock remained undiminished. Extraordinary power should never be silenced. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Magic and Warfare. This book is faithful to the original work, without half a word of magic modification. A.K. Rowling Keywords of the Novel Hogwarts Harry Potter and Glock 18 No Pop-Ups, Hogwarts Complete Collection Download of Harry Potter and Glock 18 TXT, Hogwarts Latest Chapter Reading of Harry Potter and Glock 18 Chapter 1 Glock's Forprint, Born as a Social Person You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 1 Glock's Forprint, Born as a Social Person, This Book is Faithful to the Original Work, Without Any Word of Magic Modification A.K. Rowling People living on Privet Drive know one thing. There is a strange boy living in the Dursley family in the fourth house. It is said that the strange person is the child of Mrs. Dursley's sister, but due to the unexpected death of his parents, the kind-hearted Dursley family adopted him. But people kept a polite distance from this boy, who had a strange ancient tattoo on his forehead at a young age. People even imagined that his parents had died in a gang feud, indicating that one day a group of black-clothed monsters would come knocking on the door of the Dursley family and take him away. And this strange boy's name is Harry, who is now waking up from his sleep with a cold sweat on his forehead. He grabbed the blanket and wiped it on his face. Although the occasional nightmares became less frequent and blurred as he grew older, the dark dream still made him sweat profusely. Harry pushed open the door of his bedroom and went to the bathroom. He turned on the faucet, and a cold stream of water sprayed out from the showerhead. Gradually, it warmed up, and the mist began to diffuse. He washed away the cold sweat from his forehead and used hot water to relax himself. Not long after, the sound of the water flow gradually subsided, and a big hand wiped away the steam on the mirror. Harry stared at himself in the mirror and exhaled a mouthful of turbid air. It's been eleven years, he murmured to himself. It's time for this damn dream to wake up. Harry patted his face hard and stared at himself in the mirror. He was dazed. On his forehead, there was a striking scar. The line outlined the outline of a pistol. If Harry didn't admit his mistake, it was a Glock G-18 pistol. It was a 9mm Balabellum pistol bullet. He had shot it when traveling abroad in his last life and hit three 10-shot magazines, because he scored 299 points on the 50M target, the manager of the shooting range waved his order and even gave him a gold-dot-plated Zippo lighter as a souvenir. But that was in the previous life. Yes, I am a traveler who came to this world eleven years ago and became a baby named Harry Potter. However, he felt that the world seemed a bit different from the Harry Potter world written by J.K. Rowling that he knew. For example, in the nightmare he had just dreamed of, he heard a frightened female voice calling out her husband's name. The man's name was James, and with a loud bang, the man flew backwards. The woman who should be his mother pounced in front of him, seemingly trying to protect him with her own body. Harry couldn't hear what she was saying, and he heard another loud bang. The woman also fell down. A handsome but ferocious man laughed wildly and raised a 50 caliber desert eagle in his hand, with a dazzling green flame exploding at the muzzle. This T.M.D., something's wrong. If it's Harry Potter. Shouldn't Voldemort raise his little stick and shout at himself, Avada gnaws on a big melon. It's green light, but this green light is not right. This is not Harry Potter written by J.K. Rowling, this is Hallelujah written by A.K. Rowling. God bless you, the girl wearing a bikini, from being hit by stray bullets. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. The thought of this damn setting made Harry's cheeks ache, and what made him even more distressed was that as a time traveler, he didn't seem to have the standard golden finger, any system panel, and nothing existed. 
Apart from having those absurd nightmares, everything was very normal, at least it looked like it. Most likely, I lost my head. Although my name is Harry and I live with my aunt and uncle at 4, Privet Drive, and I have a brother named Dudley, Harry at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry is more willing to believe in things like English Superman in the world. He has been to the zoo, but he hasn't made the glass disappear, allowing Dudley to have intimate contact with snakes. He hasn't flown up the chimney, causing Aunt Penny to be pointed at and scolded by the teacher, and there's no cabinet sleeping under the stairs. His bedroom is next door to Dudley, and the two of them really enjoy playing computer games that beat aliens together. They share french fries and fried chicken together, hold potato chips and squeeze into the sofa to watch TV, but Dudley's fat and muscles grow together, he is thick and strong, with amazing resistance to attacks, while Harry only has long muscles and a fierce knot with extremely strong explosive power. The two of them even swept the Southeast Youth Boxing Tournament, and even those two or three years older than them were beaten down by them. The Desley family treated him quite well. Apart from not mentioning their own parents, they didn't have much harshness towards themselves. They also hoped that the two brothers could be admitted to the Royal Military Academy together and take care of each other. After taking a shower, Harry, feeling refreshed, kicked open Dudley's open door. Wake up, brother. Today I plan to challenge myself with a 200kg squat. Would you like to give it a try later? Dolly, who was awakened by a slap, rubbed his eyes, covered his yawn, and muttered, squat your butt. Last time, my crotch broke open, and I almost dodged my waist. Just do a bench press, I'm afraid I won't be able to grow by squatting deeply. Dolly, who was rubbing his hair and climbing out of bed, stood up straight and gestured with Harry. Although their weights were almost the same, with half of Harry's head short, he looked several laps thicker than Harry, like a horse or something. Then hurry up and wash your face and brush your teeth. I'll make you breakfast, steak or pork chop. Or would you like some grilled deer legs? Deer legs, right. Dolly wiped the corner of his mouth and seemed to have already smelled the fragrance. Next weekend on your birthday, let dad take us to the countryside again and beat two deer. This thing is warm and powerful to eat. Okay, then hurry up, I can throw it in the oven and eat it hot. Harry patted his butt and went downstairs to prove that this world was not the same as the Harry Potter world. Another thing is that the technology tree in this world is not right. There are guns in this world, and Desley's family has a hunting gun that can charge for two hours and emit five pulse laser beams. Disposable high-dot-energy batteries are tube products, and low-dot-power rechargeable batteries are used in civilian firearms. There are plasma weapons and high-dot-energy radiation weapons in this world, but there are no gunpowder weapons he saw in his previous life. What Glock 18, what Desert Eagle Point 50, none of them were there, so Harry firmly believed that it was due to memories from his previous life that led to a magical nightmare. Because he was shot and caught up in a sudden gang fight on the streets of America, he should not wander around Brooklyn. Deer leg meat is leftover from the last time we ate it. It is a semi-cooked semi-dot-finished product that can emit a fragrant oil after being grilled for 15 minutes. 5 kilograms of deer leg meat is enough to fill our stomachs and go for a walk with Dolly to the gym to torture those equipment. It can become addictive to fitness and make us feel uncomfortable all day without moving. At 7 o'clock in the morning, the milkman and the newspaper man arrived one after another, wiping the oil stains from the corners of their mouths. Harry opened the door, reached out and picked up a dozen milk, then touched the mailbox and pulled out a stack of newly delivered letters. Uncle Vernon, the bill for last month has arrived, and the prize check for the Dudley boxing match with me has also been sent, adding up to £2,000. Is that right? Uncle Vernon, who was holding a coffee cup and eating bread and butter slices, raised his head and slapped Dolly on the back with his big palm, almost squeezing him into the plate. You two are both good guys. He touched his pocket and counted out a stack of bills. 300 yuan each go buy something you like yourself, and we'll save the rest for you two to use when you go to college. 
the tuition fees of the Royal Military Academy are not low at all. Even though Uncle Vernon's drilling business is doing well, it is still a bit troublesome to bear the burden of two people. They occasionally participate in prize competitions to ease the burden on their families. Hey! I have money to change into a boxing ring. Dolly happily stuffed the money into his pocket and cleared the plate a few times. What's wrong, Harry? What are you looking at? Seeing Harry staring at the letter, Dudley leaned in curiously. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry War Principal. Albus Dumbledore, President of the International Federation of Wizards, First Class Magician of the Order of Merlin, Chief Magician of Wisengamo, Dear Mr. Potter we are pleased to inform you that you have been granted permission to study at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Attached is a list of required books and equipment. The semester is scheduled to start on September 1st, and we will be waiting for your reply before July 31st. At 8 a.m. on the day of receipt, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry will send our loyal Mr. Ruber Hagrid to your home to introduce you to everything about us. Your doubts will be answered, and we look forward to meeting with you. Vice Principal, Female, Dear Maliva McGonagall. Something exploded in Harry's mind. His brain was buzzing, and the letters in his hand were scattered all over the ground, petrifying like a wooden chicken. Harry. Harry. Wake up. Wake up. Dolly looked at him with a worried expression on his face. In hesitation, he raised his right hand, spat out saliva, and rubbed it. End of this chapter. Chapter 2. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry War. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 2 Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry War, Hey! Bang, a brief and powerful slap almost took Harry's soul away. Dolly tried his best, but this guy was just like that horse or something. If he slapped the metal bucket, it would leave a big dent, and even adults would have to roll their white eyes and faint on their faces. Ah 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 it hurts. Harry's toes twitched as he rubbed his back against the sofa. When he was caught off guard, he was hit so hard that tears welled up in his eyes. Damn it, Dudley. Why did you suddenly hit me? Harry gritted his teeth and wiped away the painful tears from the corner of his eyes, glaring angrily at the initiator beside him. I thought you suddenly became foolish. This slap can ward off evil spirits. What devil Satan, just slap him. Go, go, go. Harry kicked and kicked Dudley aside, rolling his eyes in frustration. You're stupid, you're possessed by dirt. Last night, I dreamt that God's big sister in a bikini was flirting with me and inviting me to heaven to have a good time. Oh. Do those legs grow long? Long, over two meters long. Che, but that's it. I dreamt of something over three meters long. The two of them sat together again with their mouths mixed, and Harry picked up the letter. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry War As soon as these words were spoken, Aunt Penny, who had just poked her head out of the kitchen at the sound, dropped the plate in her hand and smashed it into a pile of fragments. What are you saying? Harry had never seen such a nervous Aunt Penny before. She almost rushed over and snatched the envelope from Harry's hand, looking seriously and nervously suddenly, her body softened and she fell down. Harry and Dudley quickly reached out and helped her onto the sofa. Uncle Vernon also dropped his coffee and newspaper and quickly squeezed over. What's wrong, Penny? Uncle Vernon asked with concern. Harry, he, Vernon, Aunt Penny, who suddenly felt a little overwhelmed, hugged Uncle Vernon, tears streaming down his shirt, and her sobs grew louder, unable to utter a complete sentence. What's going on, Mom? Dudley nervously held his mother's hand and asked with concern, What's wrong with you? Or what's wrong with Harry? Isn't this just a prank letter? Dolly snatched the letter and planned to tear it up and throw it into the fireplace to burn. They're here. Dudley's arm was caught by Penny, and she slowly looked up at Harry with her red and swollen eyes. They came to find you, Harry. This day. This day. 
The surging tears blocked her mouth, making her tremble and unable to utter a word. Don't cry, don't cry, auntie. Harry approached and hugged his aunt, gently patting her back. Take your time and don't worry, I'm here. After comforting for a long time, Aunt Penny slowly put away her crying. She wiped away her tears and took deep breaths to calm her mood. Do you know why your uncle and I adopted you, Harry? She spoke in a hoarse voice. Because my parents died. Yeah, my sister and my brother dot in dot law have died. Aunt Penny's absent dot minded eyes looked at Harry, but it didn't seem like she was looking at him, but rather at some imaginary shadow. Lily, my sister, she has also received this letter. Then, after she graduated, she died, leaving you as a one-year-old. Someone outside said, your parents are gangsters and they died in a gang fire. That's some stupid talk. I'm glad you didn't believe those stupid words, but I can't explain it to them. Even to you, I don't want to talk about this, and I dare not. But this day finally came. They found you. Aunt Penny grabbed Harry's hand, her eyes filled with grief. So they're my parents, Harry fell silent for a moment. How did they die? Voldemort. Who? Harry frowned. An evil black wizard, a terrorist, a terrifying person who killed your parents. Penny spoke softly in a hoarse voice. Ten years ago, a person named Dumbledore sent you to our house and told me the cause of your parents' death, which is what I said. He said, I am your only blood relative in the world, and my sister used magic to protect you before she died. And by my side, this power of protecting you will continue to exist until you reach adulthood and reach the age of seventeen. Isn't it eighteen years old before reaching adulthood? asked Dolly in confusion. That's their adult time there, Penny shook her head. They're wizards, different people from us. That's a dangerous world, Harry. My sister died there, in order to protect more people, she died there. She is my proud sister, how excellent she is. Right, Vernon? Aunt Penny looked at her husband. Yeah, she also fixed my watch. The one you gave me was the one I fell and broke the dial. Uncle Vernon glanced in the direction of the bedroom, and the watch had already been put away by him because he had gained almost twice as much weight in recent years and could no longer wear it. James is not bad either, but he's a bit reckless. I guess he's too young and restless, uh. It seemed like something interesting was happening, and Uncle Vernon let out a brief burst of laughter, but a hint of sadness flashed in his eyes. Your parents are both very good and excellent people, but because of this, they bravely stood up to fight against those bad guys. I don't know how to describe that kind of thing as magic, Aunt Penny hesitated for a moment. The world of magic is very dangerous, very dangerous. Would it be better if Harry didn't go? Dudley brushed over Harry's shoulder and patted his chest. Let's take the Royal Military Academy exam together, that's all agreed upon. But I have to go, right, Auntie? Harry gently held Aunt Penny's hand and looked into her eyes. Yes, since they came knocking, Harry must go. Why, Mom? Because this is the way to protect Harry, only magic can resist magic. This is what Lily told me back then. Some things must be done by someone. It was her back then, but now it is. Dong dong dong, the knocking on the door interrupted Aunt Penny's words, and Harry glanced at the clock in the living room. It was now exactly eight o'clock in the morning. The person mentioned in the letter who came to visit Hogwarts has already arrived at the door. I'll go open the door. With a hint of stubbornness on his face, Dudley strode out and opened the door, seemingly intending to scold and drive away the newcomer. But he froze, looking at the door and froze, just like Harry before him. This is the Desley family, right? Number 4 Privet Drive. A rough voice rang out the door, rumbling. End of this chapter. Chapter 3. Roberhaig. You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 3 Ruber Hagrid, I am Ruber Hagrid, the Hogwarts hunting ground keeper and key keeper. 
A giant over three meters tall with a waist-thick arm cast a huge shadow. His voice was loud, shaking the chandelier. However, the expression on his face was very kind, with a slightly messy beard and a smiling face underneath. His eyes were not big, but they were dark and shiny, very lively. What's wrong with you? Hagrid looked at Aunt Penny with swollen eyes and the envelope in her hand. It seems that you have received a letter from Hogwarts, and that's why I came here. Please take a seat. Uncle Vernon, who had come to his senses, pointed to the empty sofa next to him. Hagrid occupied a huge majority of the seats, and even when he sat down, his height of over three meters, like a city wall, still put a lot of pressure on people. You're Penny, right? I met you ten years ago. After sitting down, Hagrid spoke to Aunt Penny, maybe you didn't see me. I had just dug Harry out of the ruins, and at night, I was afraid of scaring you, so I didn't come forward. Did you rescue me from the ruins? Harry hesitated and asked. It was found out. Your mother protected you very well, risking her life to protect you. I demolished the collapsed ruins and found you from the pile of stones. There was magic that opened up space for you. That was your mother's last legacy. Hagrid pointed his thick fingers at Harry's forehead. Your scar is a symbol of your mother's protection for you, and also a mark left by that guy on you. Voldemort. The sofa under Hagrid's buttocks made an unbearable noise as the giant sitting on it shook violently. Yes, Hagrid nodded stiffly, few people in the wizarding world would directly say his name. We call him the mysterious man. You know who. Harry tugged at the corner of his mouth, feeling a strange emotion that was difficult to understand only when he heard the word in his own ear. I really don't know who he is. Perhaps he is an unforgivable villain, a scumbag who has done all the bad things, a crazy dictator and butcher. But at least not. At least you should not lose the courage. He has already failed, he is not invincible. I don't understand why you are afraid to fear someone who has disappeared. You don't know what that guy did, Hagrid quickly explained, and not everyone has lost their courage. What did he do, a genocide? Millions of people died under his command. Hagrid shook his head slightly, and there were not as many wizards in the wizarding world combined. What about human experiments? Dissecting people without injecting anesthesia, experimenting with erosive gases on them, watching their skin ulcerate and muscles melt, or injecting them with viruses, creating burns, and then studying how to cure them. Hagrid continued to shake his head, inexplicably, some strange images came to mind, which made him shiver. What did he do? Harry looked into Hagrid's eyes and asked seriously. He Hagrid originally intended to say. The mysterious man killed many innocent people and tortured many people who disobeyed him with the diamond heart curse, but when it came to his mouth, Hagrid couldn't explain why. Harry opened a large volume of the illustrated N.C. War Crimes and showed Hagrid the black and white photos. Perhaps in terms of annihilating humanity, we, who do not belong to the magical world, have achieved a tragic victory. Harry stuffed the book into Hagrid's arms and said, you can take a look at it. It contains a whole hell. Is your so dot called mysterious person really that scary? You dare not mention his name in ten years' time. You should be braver, big guy. You're ten times stronger than me, you should be even braver. Harry stared into Hagrid's eyes, right. You dug me out of the ruins, and you should have seen the heroic parents who died in front of me. Hagrid fell silent in this determined gaze. Yes. Hagrid gazed at the black and white photos of the illustrations on the pages. Although the people in these photos remained motionless, just rigid frames, he seemed to see countless pairs of desperate and numb eyes staring at him. The depiction of this hell was imbued with the cruelty of annihilating humanity. Yes, Voldemort. He said the name, but no longer trembled, because there was a more terrifying scene in his heart. He disdainfully kicked away the terror that the Black Demon King claimed, pure torture and death, which were not worth mentioning in front of the picture of human extinction. 
perhaps the narrow wizarding world cannot bring about a larger pattern, even in fear. I have one last thing I want to ask you, Hagrid. What's up? Hagrid put away the book Harry handed him and put it into his bottomless pocket. Is there a monument? What? When Harry saw the confusion on Hagrid's face, he waved his hand. It seems necessary for me to go there, Aunt Penny. Harry sat down again next to Penny and said, I need to go there, whether it's for myself or for my parents. Sorry Dudley, you can only go there alone, Smetton. But when I reach adulthood and graduate there, should be seventeen years old, right? Harry glanced at Hagrid and nodded at him. If I had time then, I might have worked hard to go with you to the Royal Military Academy. I wasn't even eighteen years old by then. I'm waiting for you, brother. Dolly hammered his chest and nodded at Harry. The task that was originally thought to require a lot of effort to complete was quickly finalized. Harry acted with great speed and after carefully inquiring about the necessary knowledge for admission, at nine o'clock in the morning, Harry and Hagrid stood on the small garden road of the Desley family. They were going to Diagon Alley to purchase some essential admission items. Uncle Vernon's car couldn't fit Hagrid in, so they had to go to the nearest station and use Muggle's method to get to London. Muggle refers to people who cannot use magic. With Hagrid around, no matter how crowded public transportation is, there won't be a big problem. People will actively avoid this huge mountain like man. Even if they can't let go, Hagrid can easily squeeze out a path, and Harry just needs to follow behind him. After tinkering for almost two hours, they finally arrived near their destination. It was a somewhat old commercial street with dense pedestrian traffic, and music could be heard from the record store, but it was not very clear. The Broken Cauldron Bar is a famous place where muggles can't see its door, but occasionally there are people who accidentally enter it. Hagrid pushed open a wooden door located next to the record store, which was seemingly hidden and ignored by passers-by. He bent down and walked in, followed closely by Harry. At first glance, there was a dimly lit hall, where many oddly dressed drinkers sat. A few wrinkled old ladies were drinking sherry in the corner, one of whom was smoking a long pipe and exhaling some pungent green smoke. The environment here could not be described as dirty and messy, and the floor felt like stepping on feces, covered in a thick mushroom blanket, with a disgusting and sticky smell. The floor hasn't been washed for decades, hasn't it, Hagrid? Harry rubbed his boots and frowned. Perhaps, Hagrid shrugged nonchalantly, as it was already like this when he first came here. The people in the bar seem to be very familiar with Hagrid, and everyone who sees him smiles and greets him. As usual, Hagrid, the bar owner behind the counter asked Hagrid loudly, his face wrinkled and wrinkled like a walnut. No, Tom, I'm working for Hogwarts. Hagrid patted the boss Tom's shoulder with his huge palm, but he couldn't dodge and was almost pinned down. Oh my goodness. The bar owner looked at Harry beside him after propping himself up and carefully examined him. Is this? Is this? The bar was silent for a moment. Oh my. Tom, the boss, whispered, Harry Potter. It's an honor. He quickly came out from behind the bar, ran towards the sea, grabbed his hand, and was so excited that tears welled up in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter. Welcome back. Everyone's gaze was fixed on Harry, and people got up excitedly. The sound of chairs being pulled up was everywhere, and people wanted to come up and shake hands with Harry. Hagrid smiled on the side, but Harry's face was a bit cold. Voldemort. The bar that had just become lively froze as if it had encountered a cold wave in Siberia. It seems that there are still a few people with courage. Harry stepped forward and said, It's been ten years, right? Where are the people who dare to stand up against the dark evil now? His gaze swept across the room, and no one dared him to look at each other. Let's go, Hagrid. Harry withdrew his gaze in disappointment. Hagrid followed Harry's footsteps and they walked deep into the cauldron bar, behind the gaze of the crowd. End of this chapter. Chapter 4 
Guling Pavilion Underground Arsenal. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 4 Guling Pavilion Underground Arsenal So far, Harry feels that everything in the wizarding world is normal. The Voldemort he saw in his dream holding the 50 Desert Eagle how could that thing possibly exist, right? Thinking in his heart, Harry, who was standing in front of the red brick wall, looked at Hagrid nervously. He remembered that Hagrid was using a pink umbrella, which contained his broken wand. Dumbledore repaired it with an old wand, allowing Hagrid to secretly put it away. It seems like you're not very happy, Harry. Everyone is just happy that you're back, there's no other meaning. Although Hagrid is rugged, he is a gentle giant. Yeah, I shouldn't have disappointed, but it was my parents who dealt with Voldemort, and my mother who protected me. Harry touched the Glock scar on his forehead, what qualification do I have to enjoy the flowers and applause of those brave people who should belong to them? They sacrificed their lives for it, Hagrid. Harry's voice increased a bit and spread far in the quiet cauldron bar. I hope people can remember their sacrifices. People should remember true heroes, not me, the so-called boy who survived a great disaster. The heroes who should be remembered the most. They don't even have a monument. People only remember the ones who caused fear in the past, but forget the ones who dispelled the darkness for them. Should this be? I am lucky, but I am not great. I do not deserve the flowers and applause that belong to them. Harry's voice was somewhat silent, but his words were firm. Perhaps you're right, Hagrid nodded. People were all scared, and now there probably aren't many people who can name all the people who died because of it. Hagrid's expression was somewhat disheartened, and among the people he mentioned was himself. He dug out his huge pocket that was bottomless and then pulled out a handful of cute pink umbrella. Harry breathed a sigh of relief in his heart, realizing that the world was not as outrageous as he had dreamed. What's the 50 caliber Desert Eagle? Ha <laughs> ha. Harry grinned. What? Hagrid looked at Harry in confusion. It's nothing, Harry shook his head. How should I get into Diagon Alley? There's no way here, right? Upon hearing this, Hagrid smiled at Harry and said, Look. He counted the bricks on the wall with a pink umbrella. Look carefully, count three blocks up, and then count two blocks horizontally. Stand back, Harry. He tapped the brick three times with the tip of his umbrella. The brick began to shake, and the entire red brick wall began to fold and move. A hole appeared and then grew larger, becoming an arch enough for Hagrid to pass through. The arch behind the door led to an endless cobblestone paved street. Welcome, Hagrid said. Welcome to Diagon Alley. It seemed that a familiar BGM sounded in Harry's ear, and the noisy voices of the crowd, footsteps, and various strange and indistinguishable sounds merged into his ears. Harry took a few quick steps forward, his mouth slightly open, and his eyes filled with surprise as he looked at the magical world in front of him, as if everything was normal. The dazzling sunlight shone on the crucible outside the nearest door, with a sign hanging above it that read. Copper made. Brass made. Tin tin made. Silver crucible, with complete models, automatic stirring, foldable. Harry let go of his worries, it was all so normal. It was amazing. Unfortunately, Harry only focused on looking forward and did not notice the row of slogans behind the crucible sign. Funnel type. Hinge type. Push type ammunition loader, semi-automatic and fully automatic loading, compatible with various calibers except for smoothbore ammunition, where are we going for the first stop? Hagrid. Harry spoke excitedly and tugged at Hagrid's sleeve. Of course, I'll go get the money first, right ahead. Hagrid grinned and felt Harry's excitement at the moment. It seems you're a bit impatient. Then let's go quickly and withdraw the money before we can make a big purchase. Okay. Harry spoke without hesitation and quickened his pace. Along the way, he also saw many shops, among which one with the Quidditch Boutique brand was surrounded by people, and the display windows were blocked by the crowd. 
Harry couldn't see the displayed items, but he already had the slender and elegant silhouette of a flying broom in his heart. Take the money and go buy one. He thought to himself, let's buy a wand first, this is more important. They quickly arrived at the middle section of Diagon Alley, where the Gringotts, built of white marble, was the most imposing and eye dot catching building. A figure wearing a crimson uniform stood beside the shiny bronze gate, and they were only over a meter short, surprisingly short. Gringotts is here, Hagrid said, also noticing Harry's gaze. Not bad, that's just a fairy. The two of them walked up the marble steps, and as they passed by, Harry glanced at the fairy who was bowing to them. His skin was dark, he had a pointed beard, and his hands and feet were very slender and slender. If he pulled his wrist, Harry thought he could let his hands and feet climb together. His big arms were thicker than the fairy's limbs combined. There was a silver door behind the bronze door, and a few lines of text were engraved on this double door. Harry didn't take a closer look, he just glanced and followed Hagrid into the hall. A hundred or so fairies were sitting behind a long counter, busy weighing rubies the size of their fists, carefully inspecting them with goggles, and busy registering them in the big ledger. There were countless doors in the hall, and countless fairies were leading wizards to different places to handle different businesses. Hagrid took Harry to the counter. Good morning, Hagrid said to the idle fairy at the counter, we need to withdraw some money from Mr. Harry Potter's vault. Do you have his key, sir? Here it is. Hagrid rummaged through his big pocket and scattered many miscellaneous items on the table. The fairy wrinkled her nose, but soon, Hagrid held a small golden key and handed it to the fairy. Found it. The fairy who took the key carefully checked and said, there should be no problem. I have another letter from Professor Dumbledore here, Hagrid said solemnly, bulging his chest. It's about, that thing, in Underground Vault 713. The fairy carefully read the letter and glanced at Hagrid. Very good, he said, returning the letter to Hagrid. I'll find someone to take you to these two underground vaults. Hoops. A fairy walked quickly and led them out of the hall, entering one of the countless gates. Behind the door is not a luxurious marble building, but a stone corridor, illuminated by burning torches. At the end of the stone corridor, there is a railway track erected above the abyss cave that cannot be seen from the front, without any support. A mining dump truck rushed over and stopped in front of them. After the passengers sat down, it didn't look so serious as the rail car suddenly rushed forward, accelerating from zero to one hundred kilometers or even taking less than five seconds. By 1991, this speed had surpassed countless sports cars. The thrilling sensation of lightning speed excited Harry. Boxing, wrestling, free combat, rock climbing, hunting, and other enjoyable sports were all his favorites. Now, he also needs to add a new sport. Gringotts Racing The winding railway tracks sometimes turn 180 degrees and then dive at a right angle of 90 degrees. Under the influence of magic, there is no risk of passengers being thrown out. However, the howling wind, combined with a sense of weightlessness and pushing back, creates a thrilling journey that is heart-pounding. After the car came to a stop, Harry jumped out of the car feeling refreshed, while Hagrid beside him had a green face and a look of wanting to vomit. Harry, are you okay? It feels great. Upon hearing this answer, Hagrid leaned against the wall and retched for a moment. Mr. Harry Potter's vault has arrived. The fairy pulled the ring and glanced at Hagrid. Just as he was nauseous, he happened to pass by. Fortunately, Hagrid didn't vomit, otherwise the gushing scene would have made the ring feel goosebumps all over. After opening the lock with the golden key, the pull ring handed the key to Harry, and then a green smoke sprayed out from the gap in the vault door. After the thick smoke dissipated, Harry looked inside and stood there dumbfounded. Did we make a mistake? Harry rubbed his eyes, feeling that he was probably dreaming. Are you scared? Hagrid seemed to feel better as he patted Harry's shoulder and walked in front of him. Your father and mother have left you a lot of inheritance. 
I heard that your Potter family has always been quite wealthy, and the patents for shampoo and quick-acting hair conditioners that have been popular in the wizarding world for decades belong to your family. This gold is enough for you to complete your studies at Hogwarts and settle down in the wizarding world. You can check detailed billing records for 10 years with just one payment of Garan, and you can check every income transfer. Mr. Potter, do you need this service? The fairy ring asked Harry, but Harry remained stunned and didn't answer. After a while, Harry patted his face and pinched his arm. No. What I mean is, are you sure this is a vault, not an arsenal? What you see at first glance are gold like a small mountain, silver like a big mountain, and an indistinct amount of brass, but their appearance is not the coin shape in Harry's memory, but rather 9mm caliber pistol bullets. Gold bullets, silver bullets, and brass bullets. There are at least several million copies stored here. If it can be used normally, supporting a high-dot-intensity local war would be more than enough. Arsenal. Hagrid scratched his head in confusion and then walked in. There aren't many swords inside either. Hagrid rummaged through a wooden box, holding several decorative swords inlaid with gemstones, all made of gold and silver, with the emblem of the Potter family on them. I mean that, Harry pointed to the mountains of gold. This is Jellong, this is Jean Jellong. Hagrid picked up a large handful of gold bullets and said, the silver one is silver silver silver, and the rest is coppernate. One gallon is equivalent to seventeen tails, and one west is equivalent to twenty point nine tails. It's quite simple, isn't it? He took out a pocket that served as a wallet and put some of the three currencies in it. This is enough for you to use for two semesters, he said he stuffed his heavy pocket into Harry's arms, patted the stunned Harry, and turned to the zipper, saying, now take us to Treasury 713, but can you slow down the car a bit? The speed is only one, the pull ring instinctively replied, but paused halfway through. He looked at Hagrid and said, do you want to vomit? Obviously, yes, Hagrid nodded, his face still turning slightly green. With a sigh, the pull tab pulled out a large wrench from behind his buttocks, twisted a screw on the car, and set the speed to maximum so that Hagrid wouldn't spit on his face. Mr. Potter, we're leaving now. The pull ring knocked on the dump truck with a wrench, reminding Harry to come up quickly. Oh, oh, carrying a large bag of bullets named Kingarong, Harry boarded the car in a daze, not even paying much attention to the journey ahead. When he regained his senses, Hagrid had already taken him to the sunlight. They stood outside the gate of the Gringotts, with a bustling stream of people ahead. Everything is so familiar, but it is also filled with unfamiliar alienation. Am I in the magical world, Hagrid? Harry looked up at Hagrid, whose face was pale with iron. I think so. I think I need to go back and have a refreshing drink and vomit. Pooh, I hate these little fairies. End of this chapter. Chapter 5 Winter Green Wood, Snake Monster Fawn, Phoenix Tail Feather. You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 5 Winter Green Wood, Snake Monster Fawn, Phoenix Tail Feather. Human adaptability is actually very strong, just like staying in the bathroom for a long time, you can't smell the bad smell anymore. Either the environment adapts to you or you adapt to it, Harry obviously cannot do the former, he can only choose the latter. Half-dead Hagrid dragged his heavy footsteps towards the broken cauldron bar, while Harry followed Hagrid's direction. The Ollivander Wand shop was located in the middle and back of Diagon Alley. The buildings here are much more dilapidated than the bustling commercial street ahead, with only three or four shops still showing signs of business, but all of them are deserted. The most prominent location at the intersection is the Ollivander Wand shop. Harry stopped under the shop sign and looked up. Ollivander. He has been making excellent wands since 382 BC. There is no problem with the introduction of the advertisement, which fits well with the definition of a wizard wielding a small wooden stick. However, what is displayed in the dusty shop window is not a lonely wand placed on faded velvet, but a strange wooden tube that looks very old, similar to a rolling pin. From the label on it, 
it can be seen that this is the first generation of new wands designed by Rick Ollivander for Europeans in 1230, imitating the Eastern Fire Wand. Harry became even more silent, but at the same time, he suddenly felt a little excitement in his heart. He pushed open the door, and the sound of wind chimes was clear and pleasant to the ear. The sound of the bell is coming from somewhere deep in the store. The front hall of the Ollivander wand shop is very small, with nothing but a bench. Behind the counter, a huge wooden frame extends all the way up to a ceiling over ten meters high, densely packed with small boxes and various long black boxes. There seems to be some mysterious magic hidden in the dust and silence here. Good afternoon, a soft voice said, startling Harry. Ollivander floated out of the darkness behind the counter like a ghost, with bright big eyes and light-colored pupils, making his appearance somewhat ghostly. Good afternoon, sir. Harry took a deep breath and calmed his mood. Oh, yes, Ollivander spoke. Yes, I know I'll see you soon, Harry Potter. That's not a problem. Your eyes are like your mother's. When she came here to buy her first wand, it was just yesterday. It's ten and a quarter inches long, willow wood, and the trigger makes a crisp and crisp sound. It's a great wand for casting spells. Ollivander walked up to Harry and stared at him with his moonlit silver eyes, making Harry's hair stand on end and his back cool. He seemed to have been seen through, and his gaze seemed to possess magic. Your father is different. He likes mahogany, which is eleven inches long, has good rebound, excellent flexibility, fast firing speed, and stronger strength. It's even better to use it for transformation spells. I said your father likes it. In fact, the wand chooses a wizard. Ollivander leaned closer, not looking into Harry's eyes, but at the scar on his forehead. Harry had never hidden him, and for him, Glock's forehead tattoos were actually quite handsome, matching his own Stallone-like tendrils. Different, indeed different. Ollivander touched the scar on Harry's forehead with his finger, and he murmured, there are indeed subtle differences, what an interesting discovery. What? Harry asked somewhat puzzled. Your scar. Ollivander withdrew his finger and stepped back slightly. This is a magic wand I sold, thirteen and a half inches long, made of purple wood, with strong and extremely strong strength. Ordinary people cannot pull its trigger, but it falls into the hands of bad people. A desert eagle with a caliber of 50, Harry spoke of the pistol he had seen in his dream. I don't know what it will look like afterwards, maybe it is, or maybe it's not. If one wand recognizes two wizards at the same time, I mean, if, because this kind of thing can't happen and has never happened before, then it will also appear different in the hands of two wizards. The wand chooses the wizard, the wand recognizes the wizard, and the wizard will influence the wand. They are one and mutually influential. Wand science is a very advanced discipline. If you are interested, Hogwarts has introductory books located on the east side of the library, shelf 133, the seventh book from the left on the second floor. I read it back then and it was written by my great-grandfather. It can still be used as a good introductory book. Ollivander's memory is so strong that it's unbelievable. He's at least a hundred years old, but there's no need to hesitate when recalling these things. Harry thinks he should be a person with amnesia. Let's take a measurement first, Ollivander took out a silver scale tape measure. Which hand do you usually use? Both hands are fine, I have specially trained it so that I can also make a KO with a single left hook. This is one of Harry's winning tricks in the ring competition. Generally, the strength of his left hand is weaker, and his defense against it is also slightly weaker. However, the difference in punch strength between Harry's left and right arms is not more than one kilogram. Then open your hands, okay, that's it. Measuring such clearly defined, slender, and powerful hands made Ollivander happy, and through this gap, he talked to Harry about the wand, which hit Harry's chest. Mr. Ollivander, I saw the wand displayed in the shop window, which was Europe's first modern wand. What did the old wand look like before? Well, that's right. 
Ollivander was slightly taken aback. There were very few people interested in wand studies, and it was also the first time he had heard a guest ask about it. Look, there are all the styles of wands used by wizards from ancient times to the present hanging on the wall over there. Look at the first row, that's the original appearance of the wands. Harry's gaze shifted upwards, and the wall shrouded in darkness was now illuminated by soft lights from somewhere unknown, revealing its little dot known side. But after seeing this, Harry became even more restless. Why? Why does this thing look like a whip for herding sheep? Harry pointed to the surprised opening of the wand located in the first row, where the displayed wand was a wooden stick with a thumb-thick rope tied at the front. Looking back, the wand slowly turned into a long piece of wood, with one or several ropes tied at both ends, somewhat resembling some strange stringed instrument. In the third row, the wand became a curved stick, resembling a bow and arrow. The initial use of magic by wizards was called throwing, which means that when waving a wooden stick, magic was thrown out of a wire woven from magical creatures' hair and other materials. The accuracy of this method was not good, so it was quickly improved to a flick type, which is the second row, and then evolved into a bow stick, which is the third row. From 445 AD, European wizards began to use it on a large scale. It was not until 1000 AD that Eastern wizards invented the new type of wand. However, due to the chaos of the era at that time, the concept of the new type of wand was not introduced here until 1230, and it has been improved and used to this day. Although many of the new wands have deviated from their appearance, we still use the term wand as a way to refer to them, and you can also call them gun. All right, Mr. Potter, you can let go now. Ollivander completed the measurement and turned to walk towards the shelf behind the counter. Not long after, Ollivander, who had turned back, brought several boxes. So try this one, made of beech wood and dragon teeth. The trigger nucleus is made from the dragon's heart nerve, nine inches long, which refers to the length of the gun barrel. It is thirteen inches long, and the trigger force is moderate. Give it a try. Buckle it up. Harry reached out and took the wooden handle flint gun handed over by Ollivander. This antique thing Harry had seen in pirate movies in his previous life, and pirate movies in this world all used homemade electric guns. This world had a very early use of electricity, thanks to a natural storage crystal widely present around the world. Yes, pull it up. I want to know if a wand has chosen you. Pulling the trigger to activate the trigger nucleus is the simplest test. The magic in your body can be transformed into a carrier for spells, which used to be arrows or something else, but now it's bullets. However, please rest assured that without using a spell, the transformed bullet does not possess the legitimate magical power. No warhead. Harry asked. You understand very accurately, very correctly. Ollivander nodded and looked at him with approval. You can aim here, there is a testing target here. Ollivander pointed to the right side of the counter, where there was a dummy serving as a target. Although it was not the modern pistol Harry had used in his previous life, but an ancient flint gun, this wonderful feeling still ignited a fire in his heart. What a broken wooden stick! Harry had already thrown the wand of Lashizi aside in his heart, this is the guy that a real man should use. Harry coolly turned a flower gun, his finger inserted into the trigger guard to turn the flint gun in his hand, and then he grabbed it with his finger, aiming without needing to pull the trigger. With a loud gunshot, a black smoke suddenly exploded, and Harry, who was coughing from the smoke, discovered that the flint gun in his hand had been stolen. This doesn't work, it's not suitable. Ollivander spoke repeatedly, then stuffed in a new one. Try this, ebony rhinoceros horn in unicorn fur, eight and a half inches long. Harry tried one flint gun after another, but none of them could make Ollivander nod. The boxes on the counter piled higher and higher, but the more so, the higher Ollivander's interest grew. A picky customer, isn't it? It's okay, I think we can always find the most ideal, perfect, and suitable one for you here. Let me think about it. Oh, how could we not have it? An extraordinary combination. 
winter green wood, snake monster fangs, phoenix feathers, the ultimate collision of death and rebirth, eleven inches long. Do you remember what I just said, Harry? Ollivander hesitated for a moment as he handed out the gun. He said, the person who left a scar on your forehead used a wand made of purple wood, serpent fangs, and phoenix feathers. The wand is a pair of twins, drawn from the longest and sharpest two fangs of the same snake monster, and the longest and most brilliant two tail feathers of the same phoenix. Ollivander solemnly handed the flint gun to Harry. No, this wand. Give it a try, he said Harry felt a slight pressure, and as he picked up the wand that seemed to be entwined with the threads of fate, his heart also became nervous. He held the gun in both hands, then aimed at the dummy target and pulled the trigger. End of this chapter Chapter 6 Blast A brand new weaving of fate You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 6 Blast A brand new weaving of fate a loud bang Ollivander shrank his head, while Harry was lying on his back in pain, curled up on the ground in agony from a sharp pain on his forehead, convulsing as if torn apart, accompanied by a sticky sensation. His eyes couldn't open slightly. Are you okay, kid? Ollivander quickly stepped forward and pulled out a sparkling Smith Wesson M629 revolver from his robe, with the 11.176mm caliber muzzle aimed at Harry's head. Healing as before. He pulled the trigger and there was a clicking sound, very light, but very clear in the quiet shop. Harry felt as if his forehead had been touched by something cold, and the tearing pain quickly subsided. I'm really sorry, kid. I never expected this wand to explode. Ollivander's face showed remorse and guilt, and he pulled the trigger again, with many fragments flying over from all corners. The flint gun that Harry had previously held, consisting of Hollywood, snake fangs, and phoenix feathers, had turned into dozens of fragments of varying sizes and could no longer be pieced together completely. What happened to that just now? Harry covered his forehead, and Ollivander summoned water, a towel, and a mirror. Harry looked at himself in the mirror, his face covered in blood, and there was a freshly healed scar on his forehead, rapidly fading away. He wiped his face and wiped away the bloodstains all over it. Bombing. Ollivander repeated, this is an extremely rare accident. Generally, there are only two situations that occur. First, the wand is extremely resistant to a certain wizard, even more so than hatred. Second, I don't know. I don't know. Harry turned his head and looked at Ollivander in surprise. Yes, I don't know because there have only been two explosion accidents in history, and one of them has not been recorded. The recorded incident was when a black wizard, after killing a family of 135 people, intended to kill someone with the last survivor's wand. However, the wand possessed loyalty and fortitude towards its owner, causing it to self-destruct and explode. Is that black wizard dead? No, his hand was injured. The Black Wizard strangled the last survivor with his other hand and destroyed his entire family. In the end, it was the Dark Wizard who wrote a crazy autobiography before his death that this matter became known to people. Ollivander shook his head and once again fell into contemplation. This doesn't work either. So what should we do? He paced with some distress, his expression solemn. Perhaps. Ollivander lengthened his tone and turned to look at Harry, staring at his hand and not letting go. Give me your hand. Ollivander carefully compared Harry's hands and measured them again. I understand. I understand. Ollivander, who had a sudden realization, clapped his hands happily and then rushed into the pile of shelves behind him. In just half a minute, Ollivander grabbed two boxes and ran back. He swept open the other wand boxes on the counter and opened the two boxes with great care. Two identical flint guns were put together. This is brother. Purple shirt wood, snake monster fangs, phoenix feathers and wintergreen wood, snake monster fangs, phoenix feathers, these two wands are sisters, because the phoenix tail feather as the trigger core is from a female immortal bird phoenix. And these two, 
ebony, white ivory, the June's heart tendon. What is the king? Harry asked in confusion. When you go to Hogwarts, you'll gradually understand. Ollivander placed his two guns in front of Harry. Although he was a little confused, Harry put this thing aside first, reached out and grabbed the two identical flint guns. At the moment of contact, an unprecedented sense of affinity arises. At this moment, his two guns emitted a faint light and underwent changes. The one on his right hand turned into a Glock 18, and the one on his left turned into an M1911. His right hand was shiny silver, and his left hand was matte black. Yes. That's it. Ollivander clapped his hands, his eyes filled with joy. You may not know that all wands nowadays are originally a template, although their appearance is different, their basic structure is almost the same. However, if a wizard is chosen for the wand and the fit between the wizard and it is high, the wand will undergo changes. This change occurs more than once, and as the wizard's abilities become more proficient, the wand will continue to evolve. It's like this. Ollivander took out his wand, and the Smith Wesson revolver he had just seen turned into a double-barreled flint gun, then into a double-barreled pistol, similar to a starting gun, with two hammers capable of filling two bullets at the same time. Then came the revolver he had just seen, and finally turned into a pistol with a long silencer, front grip, and rear support, and the Super Red Eagle .50 caliber micro sound rotary sniper rifle with a high power scope. In general, a wizard who has just received a wand will not let it change, but will need a period of adjustment, which may be several months or years. There are not many people who can appear immediately at the moment of purchase, about four or five out of a hundred people, but you have changed two at once, and they are completely different, which is something I have never seen before. Congratulations, Harry, Ollivander said with a smile, his eyebrows relaxed and he was obviously very happy. Congratulations on getting the wand that best suits you. Ollivander applauded Harry and said, From today on, you have officially entered the wizarding world. From now on, you are a wizard. I hope you can have great achievements in the future. Thank you, Mr. Ollivander. Harry nodded and thanked Ollivander, How much do I need to pay? For these two wands? I don't think so, Harry. Ollivander shook his head and said, Due to my mistake, I let that wand explode. This is a great sin for a staff maker, but fortunately, you are okay and have successfully found your wand. I should thank you for bringing me so many surprises, even the unexpected accident has been very inspiring to me, very inspiring. You don't need to pay, two wands are nothing to me. As long as they can be used properly in your hands, that's the best thing for me. Take it. Ollivander also brought a pair of dragon skin storage cases and tied them around Harry's waist. It's very suitable, isn't it? Great, sir. Harry turned a flower gun and handsome put them away. So remember to take good care of them. Maintaining the health of the wand is also a beneficial element for casting spells. Ollivander took out another two-finger thick book and a box that looked like a medical kit. I'll find you a backpack, you wait, he said Harry's interest in wand studies left a good impression on Ollivander. He also sells these small items here, and it's not a big deal to give them away. As the owner of Ollivander's wand shop, which monopolizes the entire England and even occupies one dot third of the European wand market, he is not short of money. Finally, Harry, carrying a black dragon skin backpack, was escorted out of the door by Ollivander, and the two waved goodbye. End of this chapter. Are you the archenemy of the hit in chapter 7? You are listening at novel full dot audio. Are you the archenemy of the hit in chapter 7? Harry was delayed for a long time in Ollivander. When he arrived at the store, it was noon, and now it was already afternoon. Within two steps, Harry saw Hagrid looking around. I'm here. Hagrid. Harry waved his hand and the giant saw it all at once. I thought you got lost, Hagrid chuckled brightly, and then handed Harry an envelope. Dedalo Digo gave it to you. They heard your previous words and everyone was very happy. 
What? Harry scratched his head in confusion. We have forgotten too much, those heroes are the ones worth remembering the most. Hagrid patted Harry's shoulder and reached out to rub his eyes. You're all so great, Harry. You told us the right thing, and Diego put in some effort to get you this photo of your parents. Hagrid stuffed the envelope into Harry's arms and said, You are a good child, sensible, righteous, and upright. Thank you. Harry accepted the envelope and smiled awkwardly. Thank you, Mr. Diggo, too. Is there anything else you haven't bought? This backpack is good, it's made of dragon skin, isn't it? I was delayed for a long time when buying the wand. This was given to me by Mr. Ollivander. He is a very good and powerful person, and I haven't bought anything else yet. I'm about to go now. Ha ha ha, choosing a wand is something worth putting effort and time into. It's still early, we have enough time. Let's go, you go buy the uniform first. I suddenly remembered that I still have something to take. See you later. Hagrid escorted Harry to the entrance of Madame Morgan's robe shop and then walked away with great strides. Madame Morkin is a short, chubby witch with a smiling face, dressed in purple clothes. Are you going to buy a uniform from Hogwarts school, my dear? She said before Harry could speak, we have a lot here. To be honest, someone is trying on clothes right now. Hogwarts school uniform is great, you must look even better. Mrs. Morkin, as a professional tailor who has practiced for 25 years, has a sharp eye. Harry, with his sturdy yet understated muscles, is the best hanger. She loves such guests the most. No matter how excellent the craftsmanship is, if the wearer is not good, it will be difficult for them to hold up their attire. Harry's gaze turned towards the hall, and in front of an isomorphic mirror, a blonde girl was gesturing for several clothes. Her skin was extremely white, but not very healthy and fair, but with a hint of colorless pallor, which made her face look somewhat sickly, with a vampire-like feeling. Harry has no interest in this type of girl. He likes sunny, healthy breasts and long thighs, but the girl in front of him has nothing to do with it. Hello. The girl saw Harry's face in the mirror, frowned, and spoke in disgust, what are you looking at? She glanced sideways at Harry, scrutinized his attire, and spat out a word that Harry had heard for the first time but could understand. Sesame seed. If you have a small chest, don't choose a tight fit. You can't hold it up, Harry said rudely, pulling the corners of his mouth to show sarcasm. What's the point of hesitation? You uneducated guy. Your parents didn't discipline you well, did they? The girl with gritted teeth finally looked at people with a straight face, her face flushed with some blood, and her words were sharp. First of all, I'm not saying, hello. Secondly, what do you have to look good at? Lastly, if your parents haven't disciplined you well, as he spoke, Harry had already walked up to the girl, raised his hand, flexed his fingers, and a crisp brain burst. I won't be polite to you. Do you really think your parents are everywhere in the world? I never expected that the two strangers we met would suddenly erupt into such a conflict. Mrs. Morkin was a bit panicked and quickly walked forward. Miss Cassandra. As soon as Mrs. Kemogen spoke, the girl rudely pushed her away and said coldly, stay away from me. She stared at Harry intently, as if about to turn into a venomous snake and pounce on him, taking a fierce bite. The red dots popping out of her eyebrows were highlighted by her pale skin. I remember you, Ma Zhong. She spoke with hatred and puffed up her chin with pride. Did I let you go? Harry reached out to support the wardrobe and blocked her way. Wizards, pure-blooded, right. Harry looked at her exquisite attire and said without doubt. Cassandra Malfoy, she said arrogantly. Cough cough. What? Harry, who was choking and coughing, looked a bit dumbfounded, as if something was wrong. But it seemed that the person in front of her had misunderstood something, and Cassandra's pride in her eyes grew even stronger. She picked up her hand and hummed out a few syllables, if you know you're afraid, just get out of here and don't get in the way. 
Perhaps you didn't hear what I just said clearly. Harry rubbed his brow as he threw away the mess. His wand had turned from a small stick to ebony and white ivory, and he should have accepted the world more confidently. Perhaps I should be more straightforward. Harry also picked up his hand, his bulging chest muscles still dancing, making the girl in front of him face black with anger. Apologize. What? She exclaimed in surprise, then looked at Harry with an incredulous gaze. Me. She pointed to herself, apologize. Ha, as if hearing some joke, an overjoyed joke, you deserve it too. Pop, another flick of her finger was much heavier than before, and Cassandra, whose tears were instantly painful, took a step back. Harry took a breath, his strong muscles congested and tense, and his figure suddenly became three points stronger. Your parents should educate you well on how to speak correctly with others. Harry took half a step forward, his aggressive heat seeming somewhat aggressive. Ma Zhong, this is not a good word, is it, Miss Malfoy? Do you really think that pure bloodline represents something? Being superior. Harry sneered at the corner of his mouth, the less a person has, the more they care about something. By the way, only animals consider pure bloodline to be impure, because it can sell more money. Why do people compete for this? Do you think you are born to be a little inferior to people, that's why you want to raise the price? You. I said, I apologize. Harry raised his eyebrows and said, I don't want to say it for the third time. His voice cooled down and he looked down at the girl from a high position. The two of them were deadlocked for a while, and a very small voice said, I'm sorry. Hmm. I said. I'm sorry. She almost gritted her teeth as she spoke, unable to say anything about Harry or admit that she was born inferior to others. She had to elevate herself out of pure blood, and Cassandra, who was completely defeated in both language and force, could only choose to bow her head. Great, it seems you still have some help. Choose the third set, although it may seem ordinary, it's not hopeless. Harry turned around, placed his backpack on a nearby chair, and then took off his coat, revealing his upper body with distinct lines outlined by a black T-shirt. Could you please measure the size, Mrs. Majin? The fabric should be high elastic and breathable. Just choose the best one. A standoff subsided, and after a moment of confusion, Mrs. Morkin hurriedly began to measure. She looked at Cassandra, who was holding her clothes, with embarrassment, but the girl didn't notice her. Not long after, Harry completed the size adjustment. In addition to the robe, Hogwarts school uniform also had several sets of short clothes that were very suitable for sports, which Cassandra had just selected. Just take this and deliver it to my house then. Cassandra spoke coldly to Madame Morkin, throwing away a set of selected clothes. Harry glanced at the third one he had just mentioned, which had advantages, such as a slim waist. Name. Are you asking me? Their eyes met once again, but they remained cold. Harry Potter, we will soon meet at Hogwarts, Miss Cassandra Malfoy. I remember you now. She squinted her eyes and planned to leave. Curiously, do you still have an older brother or younger brother named Draco? Cassandra paused for a moment, humph, she raised her chin and nodded briefly, my little brother. After seeing her leave, Harry put on his coat and stretched lazily. Oh my, the world is getting more and more interesting. End of this chapter. Chapter 8. K. Earth. Strange. You are listening at novelfull.audio. Chapter 8 K. Earth. Strange. After Harry left Madame Morkin's robe shop, there was something more in his backpack. Mr. Ollivander was a generous person, and this black dragon skin backpack was expanded with the untraced stretching curse. The space inside was not particularly large, about ten times the original volume. And it's very convenient to retrieve things, just reach out and there's magic inside to help stack and place them, it's really magical. Hagrid was already waiting at the store entrance, holding a large bowl of ice cream in one hand and a cage in the other. 
A beautiful snow owl was looking curiously at Harry. It's really beautiful, Hagrid. Harry extended his finger into the cage, and the beautiful owl lightly pecked with its beak, as if indicating intimacy. It's good if you like it, Hagrid handed the ice cream to Harry. Your birthday is still half a month away, but I probably won't be able to go there then. As a birthday gift, I wish you a happy birthday in advance, Harry. Thank you, Hagrid. You're welcome, let's go. We still have a lot of things to buy. They went to Lycan Bookstore to buy a complete set of textbooks, and then went to the grocery store to buy crucibles and various utensils. The scattered things were diverse, and the rich and colorful world of magic was also revealed to Harry at this moment. What caught his attention the most was the Quidditch specialty store. After buying all the school props, Harry arrived at the entrance of the store. It was around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and the sun was scorching. There were fewer people looking around the showcase, and the things displayed behind the showcase were able to be seen. Boys all like this, and of course girls also like it. Hagrid spoke happily, it's just that there's nothing my size can ride. I have a motorcycle, that's pretty good. Although Harry was mentally prepared to accept this absurd magical world, he still couldn't calm down after seeing what was displayed in the showcase. The halo represents the company that produces it, the 2000 model represents its model, everything is normal here, but the intercontinental region behind it represents its ability to travel long distances, with enough endurance to cross continents. Flying represents it flying in the sky, and the bullet represents it it means it's a missile. Light will 2000 intercontinental missile. Guanluan Company strives to create professional competitive missiles, ushering in a new era of Quidditch. The top speed is 300 km per hour, with an ultra-durable range. Whether the race lasts for a week or a month, the Light Wheel 2000 never stops. Harry, who was shocked by the advertising slogan, swallowed his saliva. The intercontinental missile, with a diameter of about 20 cm and a length of 1.8 m, was small and powerful. Its streamlined body shone with a metallic luster, but it was not dazzling. The white coating was simple and atmospheric, and the four tail wings at the tail were flexible and natural. There were also eight turning nozzles distributed at the front and back ends, ensuring that the rider could turn quickly and sensitively in the sky. Even if Harry scrutinized it with the most critical gaze, he couldn't pick out any flaws at all. This is not a tool at all, but an artwork placed behind the showcase. Hagrid, wait a minute. I feel like if I don't buy it back, I won't be able to sleep. But first that your students cannot bring this. You have flying classes and can only sign up for the Quidditch school team in second grade, Harry. But there are always exceptions, right? I feel like I don't need to wait for second grade, I'm an all dot around athlete. Harry patted his chest and said, Gringotts dump truck is so fast, but it doesn't affect me at all. I was born into this profession, Hagrid. If it really doesn't work out, I won't take it out. Just put it in my bag, okay? After hesitating a few times, Hagrid nodded as he saw Harry so determined to acquire the Lightwell 2000, and that he indeed had a much stronger talent for this fast dot moving thing than himself. After going to school, it's best for you to talk to your dean and see what the professor says. No problem, no problem. Harry pulled Hagrid open the store door and said, I want it. The Light Wheel 2000 Intercontinental Missile. He took out his own money bag and spoke confidently. Welcome. My respected guest. As soon as he heard that the business was coming, the store manager greeted him with a smile on his face. Dear valued customer, I am Marco, the store manager here. Do you want a 2000 Light Wheel, right? Yes, Harry nodded firmly. There are only two units left in stock, and you came by a stroke of luck. The newly launched Guanluan 2000 has a low production capacity, but each unit is a high quality item. 230 gallons, if you want, I'll bring it to you immediately. A small pile of gold jargon was dumped out of Harry's pocket, and there were specialized tools in the shop for counting coins. 
pouring the gold jargon in and shaking it, the gold bullets would form a regular pattern of ten in a row. In less than fifteen seconds, Mark smiled and put away the jargon. Please wait here for a moment. If you are interested, you can take a look at other things, such as the best maintenance tools, upgraded and replaceable invisible seats, wind and rain barriers for long dot distance travel, and even foldable single beds. We have everything here. He bowed slightly and retreated to the warehouse behind him. Taking advantage of this moment, Harry also looked at the other flying tools in the Quidditch boutique. The advertising slogan of Guangluan 2000 is indeed not fake. It is indeed a missile that opens up a new era, because the previous one was not called a missile, but a rocket. For example, the various models of rockets in the Sweeping series and Comet series are much thinner than the Lightwheel 2000, with a diameter of about less than 10 cm and a length of only about 1.5 meters. They have a tail wing, but no turning nozzle, and their top speed is only about 180 to 200 km per hour, which is greatly reduced by the Lightwheel 2000. Except for the brooms used in these competitions, the wizards used rockets instead of bullets for their regular travels. This type of rocket, which allows one to three people to sit on it, is as short as 1.8 meters and as long as 3.4 meters. Although its flexibility cannot be compared to that used in competitions, its comfort and stability are greatly improved. The acceleration is smooth, and it can accelerate to 150 km per hour in about 30 seconds. If three people are fully loaded, the speed will decrease slightly, about 120 km per hour. It is almost a necessary companion for wizards to travel at home, and it can also fold, when not needed, it can be folded into a space-saving cylinder and used as a chair. Harry, who was not short of money, upgraded the invisible seat cushion. He tried the original version, but it was a bit hard and not very comfortable. With a set of maintenance tools, Harry didn't need anything else. He planned to participate in the Quidditch competition, and the components that provide shelter from wind and rain were not allowed to be used. Satisfied. There's nothing more satisfying for Harry than today. Bringing the Halo 2000 to the market is not a good choice. Harry stuffed it into his backpack and finally went to a shop selling snacks in the magical world. He packaged a few portions of every food he had never tried before, which he wanted to take home and share. When it was time to separate from Hagrid, Hagrid handed over an envelope and said, This is your ticket to Hogwarts. On September 1st, at King's Cross Station, it's all written on the ticket. Hagrid finally patted Harry's shoulder and said, Goodbye to our school, Harry. See you at school, Hagrid. Harry set out on his way home and waved goodbye to Hagrid. End of this chapter. Chapter 9 Ebony and White Ivory Hunting in the Jungle, Part 1 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 9 Ebony and White Ivory Hunting in the Jungle, Part 1 Dolly's grandfather lives in the countryside, where there are beautiful hills and small lakes like crystals. Desley's old house is located not far from the lake. The old man's favorite is to go fishing by the lake with a fishing rod on sunny days. This is a good place for retirement, quiet and comfortable, with few people disturbing. To be honest, the elderly wouldn't like their sons and grandchildren to come and see them. Today is another lively day because Harry's birthday is coming. Uncle Vernon took advantage of the weekend to drive his family to the countryside and set off happily with a shotgun. Since the children were eight years old, he brought Harry here, and Harry learned the skills taught by his grandfather in less than an hour. After hitting two fat rabbits with his own hands and returning, he would bring the children when he had time, not just to crave a bite of wild game. In fact, it was also true. Harry's grilled meat, stewed meat, and stewed soup are extremely delicious. This child seems to be born with a cooking talent. Whenever those prey are processed into delicious food, he always forgets the fact that he still lives in the food desert of England. I'm going to the forest to take a look, hoping to get a deer back today. After a while, hunting will be banned, and we'll have to wait until next year. 
rabbits are not as good as deer. Dolly, are you going or not? Harry shouted loudly towards the direction of the back door. I'm digging the soil for my grandmother. She said I need to be thinner to look good, and I'm sweating. Dolly, who was carrying tools to help his grandmother cultivate her backyard, wiped his face and instantly became a flower cat, but he didn't care about it either. If you encounter wild chickens, remember to bring back two. I want to try the mud chicken I made last time. There are plenty of wild chickens. Remember to go to the lake later and help Grandpa get the fish back. Uncle Vernon, let's go. We need to come back before four o'clock. It will take a lot of effort to deal with those things. I'm not proficient in magic yet, but unfortunately I can only use it this year. After enrollment, I won't be able to use magic outside. It's the same without magic, Uncle Vernon chuckled happily. Let's go, Harry. Let's go and come back quickly. I hope we have good luck today. They got into their grandfather's pickup truck, and Uncle Vernon's sedan was not suitable for driving on dirt roads in the countryside, let alone going into the mountains. After driving along a relatively flat road for over half an hour, they quickly left the town behind and plunged into the hills and mountains. This is a legal hunting ground, and deer hunting has a limited time slot, but it is not necessary to hunt the rampant wild chickens, rabbits, squirrels, and wild boars. However, this guy has a tough and strong taste, and to be honest, it is not delicious. After parking the car, Harry got off the car. Uncle Vernon's 300-pound body was not suitable for entering the mountains, and he had to pant before walking too far. This kind of thing happened to Harry alone or with Dudley. He waved his hand at Uncle Vernon and ran into the forest in a short run. Due to the fact that the world has always used clean electricity and does not cause much damage to forests, brown bears have not become extinct in England, and even many wild animals are showing signs of flooding. It is necessary to regularly open hunting to allow hunters to control populations with signs of flooding in order to maintain ecological stability. Beasts have been killed by people due to danger, so it is natural to have to put in more effort. Harry's entry into the mountain actually had another consideration. He needed a testing ground without neighbors or strangers to disturb, to try his spell and wand. His two wands. The ebony M1911 on his left hand and the white ivory Glock G18 on his right hand have completely different attributes. Ebony is a powerful single-shot wand with a casting interval similar to a cooldown CD, about one second. It seems to consume more magic while casting, and the sound of firing is even more muffled. The white elephant is different. It is very lightweight, with a very sensitive and light trigger. It can cast spells continuously, one after another, and consumes less magic than ebony. The sound of the gun is crisp. Most importantly, the white elephant has a fast and slow handle that changes the firing mode, with a single shot up, a continuous shot down, and a fully automatic continuous shot. As long as Harry uses a spell and pulls the trigger, the same spell will pour out at a speed of three rounds per second, which is by no means the limit of white ivory. Although Harry, who only relies on self.study, has used magic, it is obvious that there is a lot of room for improvement in his casting. With proper and good education, Harry believes that he can quickly fire 8 to 10 spells per second using white ivory. Although it is only about half the firing speed of a truly automatic Glock, Harry is already very satisfied. No matter how fast he feels, he will not be able to supply his magic. The steps to use a spell are generally to gather magic and condense bullets, then cast a spell to shape a bullet called magic, pull the trigger, and the spell is fired. The convergence and output speed of magic have become the key constraints on the firing rate of white ivory, but this is a problem for Harry, not for other wizards because they cannot do what Harry does. According to the book Etiquette, Fundamentals, and Advancements of Dueling, written by Professor Felius Flavian, wizards seem to lack the ability to fully automatic continuous firing. In this book, Professor Flavian has posted a lot of wand shapes, which are suitable for different types of dueling situations with different needs, such as standard 20-step fighting fields, 
indoor obstacle encounter combat dueling fields, and large open space dueling fields. All the weapons inside are single-shot firearms without exception, even those with continuous firing capabilities, such as AK-47, M4A1, L85A1, 416 Hong Kong dollars, etc., are only single-shot versions. Fully automatic seems to not exist in the wizarding world. Witches who are skilled in dueling have trained a Kato Eagle's hand, and the faster they pull the trigger, the faster the curse naturally shoots. Harry knew he was an exception. The limit on the total amount of magic that wizards originally did not have has become a problem Harry needs to face due to the fully automatic combo of white ivory. With a high rate of fire, Harry had to take a break for every 100 bullets he missed, allowing his magic to regroup. However, the steady single-shot ebony could fill in some of the combat power in the vacuum zone. The content of standard spells. Beginner has become familiar to Harry in a short period of time. He even has time to look at the textbooks of the higher grades. The magic he needs to learn in the first grade is small spells for daily life, which are not difficult, and even very simple. However, with the additional second and third grade spell textbooks he bought, Harry can only learn some simple ones. Some of the techniques in the books are relatively vague, and these contents need to be taught by the professors through words and deeds. Harry is most skilled in weapons besides yours. This spell seems to have been developed for him by nature, and Harry needs to try several times to slowly master the other spells, while the disarming spell Harry raised his white ivory and saw a porcupine blocking the way in front of him. Get rid of your weapons. Harry pulled the trigger, and a crisp gunshot sounded at this moment. Before learning the silent curse, any magic would make a magical explosion sound, like the sound of gunpowder exploding. The continuous recoil tightened Harry's right arm, and his iron-like arm and body withstood the shock. A series of red lights burst out, and the frightened porcupine ran away. However, the spell had already been hit one after another. The Glock 18's fully automatic burst has another issue, which is that its accuracy is not very high, slightly inferior to submachine guns, let alone compared to rifles. However, within a range of 50 meters, the red bullets splashing with water cannot be tilted much. The porcupine, hit by the disarming curse, is currently experiencing the most tragic moment of being a pig. The hard needle he used as a weapon was confiscated by the disarming curse, and in an instant, it became bald. The porcupine, without any hair, screamed hysterically and rushed into the forest. Ha, huh, Harry turned his gun and blew the non-dot-existent smoke. Cool. After indulging in a wild experiment of magic, he put away his two guns and removed the real hunting rifle from behind. He checked the rechargeable battery, adjusted his sights, and walked deeper into the forest. End of this chapter. Chapter 10. Ebony and White Ivory. Hunting in the Jungle, Central. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 10. Ebony and White Ivory. Hunting in the Jungle, Central, Grandpa is a seasoned hunter, but now Uncle Vernon, who has become the succulent mountain demon king, cannot inherit his father's legacy. Harry, with his outstanding talent, has become Grandpa's successor. He treats Harry as his own grandson, his grandmother loves Dudley more, and his grandfather loves Harry more. They both share the love of the old man. Searching for prey in the woods is not difficult for Harry. His eyes are very good, much more powerful than the average person, and his dynamic vision is also excellent. He can even see the direction of rotation of a tennis ball being hit at high speed. At school, Harry also has the nickname, Tennis Prince, and many little fans. This innate talent enables Harry to become an extremely excellent hunter. Is there a group of goats nearby? Harry used a branch to pick up the scattered feces on the ground, which was very fresh. The sheep were nearby, and if you look at the footprints, it should be a group of four big and three small little goats. It is now the end of July and the lambs are about 4.6 months old, which is the most beautiful time for meat. If you can't hunt deer, getting a lamb back is also a good choice. Tonight, 
you can make a roasted lamb and braise a sheep head. Harry really likes this bite. He followed the direction indicated by the sheep dung ball and soon climbed over a small hill. Harry's movements became more cautious, and his gaze scanned all directions, searching for the traces of prey. Suddenly, his ears twitched and a sense of crisis emerged in his heart, prompting him to pounce on the side. There were bears in the forest that Harry had seen once, but bears usually didn't cause trouble. Terrifying upright apes and other creatures, fierce beasts would not attack unless they were very hungry because they were not familiar with them and tended to hunt familiar prey. A spark of a curse brushed past Harry, and he turned his head suddenly to see a scruffy man with a puzzled and shocked expression. This man was wearing a tattered robe, obviously torn by thorns while running in the woods, and he was carrying a bag in the other hand, heavy and heavy. It's a wizard. And he doesn't mean well to himself. Harry, who had this idea flashing through his mind, quickly lifted his gun, but the opponent pulled the trigger faster. The speed of the curse's flight was no match for the high dot energy pulse laser beam of the hunting gun, but within such a short distance, the speed difference was greatly weakened. Harry, who twisted forcefully, couldn't continue shooting. The hunting TTS pulse shotgun in his hand was hit by a red spell, and he suddenly released it, flying several meters away. It's a surrender curse. Harry's mind was exceptionally clear at this moment. After seeing his weapon fly, the scruffy man obviously relaxed his guard. However, he knew Harry was agile, so he approached closer, so the accuracy of the spell would be higher. A muggle can still deal with wizards without a weapon in his hand. He smiled contemptuously and said, Kid, I won't kill you, as long as you do a small favor. His muzzle drooped slightly, but Harry saw a hint of cunning in that person's eyes. Right now. Harry turned to the left and lifted the hem of his assault suit with his left hand. He quickly pulled out the ebony and swung his wrist to lift the muzzle. Get rid of your weapons. Bang, bang, a dazzling spark exploded in mid-air amidst almost simultaneous curses, and the man's face visibly showed astonishment. Why did the muggle boy in front of him suddenly turn into a wizard? The powerful single-shot spell of ebony is not suitable for this occasion, but just now Harry's center of gravity was unstable, and he couldn't spin to the other side and extract his white ivory. But this shot created an opportunity for him, as he lifted his assault suit and grabbed his Glock G18. The messy wizard in front of him was obviously more experienced in combat than Harry. After a brief moment of shock, he kept pulling the trigger, and the benefits of the silent spell were there. Harry needed to recite the spell, but the man raised his hand and shot it. Harry, who was instantly suppressed, quickly dodged, and the protruding rock on one side became his temporary shelter. However, before he could stand firm, the sound of the rock being blasted appeared, and the smash curse shattered one dot third of the rock. The already small shelter was now in danger. But suddenly, the gunfire stopped, and the man seemed to have encountered greater trouble. More voices came from behind, and Harry heard a clear curse. These damn Aurora. When I get out of the anti-ghosting range, I'll have to kill you bunch of dogs. He gritted his teeth and cursed, with four or five figures already rushing out of the bushes behind him. The man raised his hand with an explosive curse, but was blocked by a magic shield and blew away a large area of withered branches and leaves. You guys wait for me. He suddenly threw out the bag in his hand, looking at his sore face, obviously very unwilling, but now he needs to break the game. A curse that followed closely tore open the bag, and a heavy object landed with a loud noise. A purple-gray monster with sharp horns escaped, and a huge monster with a shoulder height of at least three meters was several times stronger than Sharma. At the moment of landing, the already irritable monster rushed towards the group of Aurora, and the messy man saw the opportunity and was about to flee with a single arrow step. But he forgot that there was still one person present. Harry had already grasped his ebony and white ivory, his cold and sharp gaze fixed on the fleeing figure, holding his two guns flat. Faint and fall to the ground. He pulled the trigger of white ivory, 
and at this moment, the Glock G18 emitted an astonishing barrage of bullets. One second three shots may not sound too fast, but the flying speed of the curse is already visible to the naked eye, much slower than supersonic bullets. The ultra-stable shooting of three shots in one second makes the red barrage densely packed and frightening. The spell that splashed like water pulled out a horizontal line, and the scruffy man's eyes were about to crack at this moment. How could this little wizard, who was only in third or fourth grade at most and had not grown hair, cast spells so proficiently? He hastily pulled the trigger and propped up the walls of the iron armor curse, but couldn't even hold on for two seconds in the barrage of white ivory bullets. With a slightly dull gunshot, Ebony fired a powerful spell that shattered the iron armor spell and hit his side waist. The scruffy man who fainted instantly fell to the ground, and White Ivory added two shots to make him sleep more thoroughly. The Aurora, who were entangled with the purple-gray monster, were also shocked. A round-faced female Aurora almost got hit by the monster's horns, and her companions pulled her away. Send a signal to remove the anti-phantom shapeshifting. Quick! Someone raised the famus in their hand and sent a three-shot signal to the sky. Be careful. The horned camel beast has been drugged by that miscellaneous substance. An auror, covering his shoulders, screamed out in agony. His arm was hard bitten off by a horned camel, and his sharp horns almost tore open his stomach. Anti-phantom shift should be lifted quickly. These bastards. After losing a companion, the remaining three faced even more difficulty in dealing with this crazy horned camel. The horned camel was almost immune to all their magic, and its skin, which was even stronger than dragon skin, made it highly resistant to spells. Withdraw. Withdraw. Tonks and Leo, you two take wood away and stay away for now, waiting for the phantom to move. I'm attracting attention, you guys, quickly dodge. Without ten people going up together, we can't knock this guy out. The captain of the team turned his bolita into a Remington M870 shotgun and said, Look at me, beast. End of this chapter.